Welcome to the Calgary Sessions. This is episode number 44. I'm your host, Jeff Humphreys. Uh, today's guest, I always say it, this is going to be a cool one. Uh, another amazing athlete, cool human. We just talked off camera for like 20 minutes by accident. I thought we were rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him the bait and switch. I didn't hit record. Um, so yeah, man, introduce yourself, name, and uh, what you're up to. Uh, Mike Edom, um, going to my 10th year in the CFL. Um, Who you play for? Play for the Rough Riders. Yeah, just free, a shout out. Free safety. Mm -hmm. um, recently married, um, settled down, and you know, trying to get ready for the next phase of life. Yeah, man. Yeah. Which will be, and it'll be, this will be a cool conversation just because of uh, where you are in your career. Yeah. The settle down, the next phase. And right. So, yeah, this will be a really cool one for me to just hear like face to face. You know, I've never really talked about the next phase. Which? Openly. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you don't want to ever talk about the end. Yeah. You always want to kind of just arrive, at, mm -hmm. arrive there. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be interesting. Well, and yeah, interesting on so many different levels. Right. right. Uh, so the gist of the show is I'd like the guests to kind of go back as far as they want to go. You know, kind of your origin story, how you grew up, where your Oof. inspiration was. Oof. So I want you to go back to wherever you like, start remembering things. You got enough things. tape? Yeah, dude, we got a lot to, <laughs> we're good to go. <laughs> Man. Um, so, so you go back. I, I feel like, <sighs> yeah. We'll get into it. Go back to Ajayi Street, Lagos, Nigeria. You know, that's where I grew up. No way. Yeah. Uh, um, age to age, like born to what born age? Born to uh, 12. And yeah, and then my uncle was an ambassador for, he was an ambassador. I think he had a stink in Canada. He went to school in Montreal. He had a stink out here in Canada. Loved the country, loved the economy. Went back home, told his brother, my dad, you know, you have a young family, you know, the reason why you, he moved from the States back home was for his mom and then she had passed away. So essentially he was like, he already had plans of moving back to the States. Yep. So my uncle was kind of like, well, you know, the health, you know, the healthcare in the States is kind of, you know, the insurance got to pay, but this other country right beside it, they have a great healthcare system. You know, it, it would be a good thing for you to give it a try instead of going back to California since you've already lived in California. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Canada, believe it or not. Uh, what happened from, Zero to twelve, like what's happening in Nigeria? Like what is like what is dude? I have zero idea of what you how you lived. So, so we, I mean, we were pretty. My parents worked, you know, had careers. My mom was a courier. She worked at Nestle. Yeah. My dad worked for the government. So we were we 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 lived a good life. Yep. You know, we we weren't lacking. But there's some essentials in Nigeria that's just hard to come by. It's like such as water sometimes and, and power. So one of the challenging things I grew up with, like, you know, the kerosene lanterns, right? Mm -hmm. I got I, calmed, I, I got used to using that to do my homework because the power can be out for X amount of days and you don't know when the power's gonna come back on. So you gotta find a way to get that lamp, get the kerosene in there, light it, and do your homework, and then put it out before you go to sleep so it doesn't start a fire. You know, I learned to walk to the well when the water system in the house was shut down or somewhere on the pipes. You walk to the well, you fetch water, you bring it home, you boil it, you know, you shower, you, and then, I walk my little sister to school and then walk myself to school. And then after school, walk to get my little sister and then walk back home. And she, her school was about 20 minutes from my house. And my school was about the opposite way, 20 minutes. You're huffing. Yeah. At a young age. At a young age. And I was left to take care of my little sister because <laughs> my older sister went to boarding school. Yep. So when she was out of the picture, I kind of felt the, I got to step up and beat up my little sister. Mm -hmm. And then I never understood why my parents <laughs> didn't put us in the same school. You know, so <laughs> if you, if you, if you right. because like, me and my older sister went to the same school, right? Okay. And then I was like, why, why didn't you just put her in the same school? And then I don't have to walk so far. But whatever happened, you know, it made me who I am. I learned you know, crazy. Yeah. Um, do you remember a lot from those years? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Like, those were the criti critical years of my life. Yep. Yeah. Um, and m mom and dad just let you do your thing. Like, was sports a thing back then? Was it like be st you know be good at school? Like, what was so, the tone? So what's what, what the thing with sports is when you have a sister in the house who's a scholar, it's it's tough for you to push sports on your parents mm -hmm. for you to get them to sign off on sports. Your sister was smart, smart. She is the first black female neurosurgeon in Canada. No shit. Yeah. Oh, so she's like Joy Adam. Look her up. I will look first, her up. First black female neurosurgeon in Canada. Insane. So when report cards <laughs> came home. Dude, I would hold mine off for like two weeks. And it wasn't like- it was like, it burn you Right, and it's not like you can give it the next day because they're so joyous of her A's and the comments and the, 
you know, so I like, let me let me wait for the thunder to die down a little bit before I put this C plus out there. <laughs> Strong C's. Right. And my dad knew I wasn't good at school, so but one thing that really ticked him off was the comments. Like he didn't care about the grades. He yep. just wanted to know you were behaving and acting accordingly in school. Yep. So the comments really used to take him off and yeah. What, 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 were, what were teachers saying about you? What was your personality? He's a rolling stone. He can't never sit still. He's always in the hallways. Is it He's always pestering the girls. All true, though? Yeah. Well, well yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not it. <laughs> you can't shake it. No. I'm too old to be sitting here lying to myself. <laughs> I'll be honest. They were, they were true. And so for me, when I found, I started playing soccer. I was a goalie. And that was just because I just, you know, just to play on the streets with no shoes in Nigeria. Yep. You know, with put two rocks as, as a goal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like, I kind of like the sport. I kinda, I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. You know, tried out for the school. I made, I think I was the youngest guy on the varsity team. And I beat out the, the guy that was starting last previous year for the, um, the goalie spot. Mm -hmm. Why'd you go to become a goalie? Because I was, I was too young. Yeah. I was too young to play, play the field. And we had way better, mm -hmm. more developed athletes to gotcha. play the field. Gotcha. So they were like, you know what? He's decent. We'll figure just it out. put him at goal. Yeah, mm -hmm. figure it out. And then, you know, came here and the soccer wasn't the same. So you're 12, moved to Montreal. No, moved to Toronto. Toronto, sorry. Yeah, Cape on Avenue. Was it <clears throat> when your uncle Kim comes back and like talks to your dad and says like, you know, you said like healthcare, like yeah. these basic things right. as like a selling right. piece to cut, to like move to right. a different country. Right. It's so, it's, it's so different. To, to th those are the reasons to move, right? Proper healthcare. And, and, and then like, one of the biggest reasons also was because my sister. So she was about to enter university and the Nigerian schooling system, they'd have these strikes that would last four years, right? Mm. So he's looking, he's like, okay, if she's a, if she's a scholar and, you know, the school system is tanking, yep. I have to give her the best chance to succeed and that's to get her out of there, you know? So for him to have that thought process and a mortgage, his pension, his future, my mom, you know, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. and say, okay, we're going to take these kids to a better opportunity, a land with better yep. opportunity and see what happens, you know. Dude, to that, say, that thought process is wild. Just to just insane. say, right, sacrifice everything and say, you know what, my daughter's about to be in university. I didn't give her the best shot to succeed. Let's all move the family. Even though we got to start from scratch when we get there. We're going to you zero. know, we're losing all our networking that we, you know, mm -hmm. all the networks we yeah. have back family, home, family networking. members. We don't know anyone there. You know, we really packed up everything we had in bags and moved out here. Did you did you know how wild that was when it happened, or have you been able to look back on it and realize that your parents did something insane? It was insane when we got to Amsterdam. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you're like, you're connection like <laughs> flight. Got to Amsterdam, and I was like, <laughs> okay, so we're out of Nigeria. This is different. I've never been out of Nigeria. And what, 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 where were your flags that you were just like, oh it, God, oh it God. It was just, it was just different. You know, like, like I've, I've only seen my kind of race, yep. not to be racial. Dude, dude, I've only seen, no. <laughs> right. I was only used, you'd see a few government workers yep. that were of other races in yep. Nigeria, right? You, and then their kids went to school with to our school, right? So you'd see different, mm -hmm. but I'd never seen an abundant amount. It'd be yeah. one every one year or whatever, right? So that was the first. And then when we got to Toronto, it was snowing. <laughs> no way. It was snowing. So I'm standing there. <laughs> I'm outside. My hands are cold <laughs> and it's just snowing. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> I remember that night when we got to the hotel, I literally didn't sleep. I just watched it snow. I watched this and I was like, what has this man done? Just questioning everything like right what? i'm sleeping on the bed of my i'm sleeping on the bed of my little sister all three of us are cramped up in the bed you know i left my room where i had my space you know mm -hmm. um my, we don't have a kitchen in the hotel room. my mom can't even cook we had to go buy food you know it's my first time eating a burger <laughs> so <laughs> meat and a bread Dad. and lettuce <laughs> what is this <laughs> you know so it was uh you know it was it was tough so when you to look back on it now and know what your mom and dad decided to do for the kids. Right. When did you realize that was uh, a monumental thing they've done? Did it take you years to figure it out or what they did was like for the betterment of you guys? Yeah, I did. Because when I first got here, I didn't understand it. You were more like pissed off? Or yes. Like, yeah. I, I resented it because when I got here, I was, I was bullied. I was judged. I was criticized for the way. Because, you know, Nigeria's colonized by the British. 
So there's certain words that I, I said that kids in school would be like, what was he talking about? Mm -hmm. So the trucks were called lorries. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, pool called snooker. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly even like soccer, football. Oh, so yeah. there's certain things, the words, yeah. the way I, I answered questions in class. In Nigeria, when you ask a question, you put your hand up and they pick you. You get up, you go to the front of the class mm -hmm. and you answer the question. Mm -hmm. I tucked my shirt in, wore, wore a tie, mm -hmm. you know, so. They didn't understand it. Yeah, you you're know. way you were way different. Way different. Yeah. So in a way, I started resenting it because yeah. I was like, "Man, no, this is not for me." Which makes sense, though, right? right? As a young kid, to get like to not fit in. Right. But then when I started getting in trouble, I started. Did you acting out or what? Yes, I was acting out. Yeah. Um, so in Nigeria, my dad was never really around because he worked so much, and then all of a sudden he was around. So I. All of a sudden, I wanted to be out the house. Mm. So when you're out the house, mm. you're hanging out with the wrong crowd, yeah. you're bound to get in trouble. So there's one time I got in trouble, my dad did not help me. Just left left you hanging? Left me hanging. He said, yeah. he said you have to figure this out for yourself. And he's like, whatever's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And then he scared me and said, if the legal system <laughs> wants to send you back home, deport you, just so you know, they can do that. So he's like telling me consequences of me acting out what it can end up being. So one day I got in real bad trouble and his older brother called me from Nigeria, <laughs> Uncle Sam. <laughs> and he was like, you know what? I think your dad's ready to send you back home. He's like, your cousins are back here. You can come back home and live, live with us. Obviously, you know, you're not understanding the opportunities presented in front of you and the luxury that you have. So, you know, it's the last time. See you shortly. Another, another slip up, you know, yep. in trouble. And then my sister said this thing to me one time I got in after I got in trouble. She's like, what are you passionate about? Like, you just seem to be kind of like just. How much older? She's one year older. Okay. But sounds way more mature. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. <laughs> She's one year older. <laughs> okay. That, which is a, a, a big question to ask at a young age. Yeah. Right? So she kind of asked, you know, what, what are you passionate about? You remember this? Oh, yeah. I remember I had no clue. I know I had soccer. So I love soccer. I want to be the next Ronaldinho. So she's like, all right, well, you have to start understanding to um, direct your energy to things that you're passionate about. After school, hanging out, you know, with your friends on the basketball court while you guys are smoking weed and doing all this stuff does not help you become a good soccer player. You know, going to the field with a soccer ball, practicing, is what's going to make you a better soccer player. Wow. So she just started instilling these little things in me. And then I wasn't good at school. And then it got to the point where I didn't really have much options coming out of high school because my grades weren't that good. Yep. I just played one year of football, you know, and soccer was not. I started playing football because, you know, I just, I started being more athletic. I started doing more athletic stuff, playing running track, mm. you know, playing basketball. I started doing all these different, because I'm trying to figure out what my passion is, right? Yep. So I was like, I love soccer, but what else is there? What maybe? else is there for me? Right, yeah, yeah. right. And then I started like just talking to kids in school, you know. And one time I saw the football team try out, so I kind of just watched it. Hell, Brathway is great now. I kind of just watched. So like, okay, the basketball guys get all the attention from the girls, <laughs> but these football guys, they like worship like gods. <laughs> it's a different league. Like, <laughs> dude, they like they would it, like school would end, and the football guys would be walking to the football um, area you know, where the locker room, where the locker room was. And yeah. I would just see like, they're shaking everyone's hand on the side. Everyone knows who they are. You know, they got the Leatherman jackets on. So I was like, that's the group I want to be. These guys got it figured. Right. <laughs> but then when I got involved in football, I was so bad. You were, but like late in life though, Grade right? 12. Yeah. I was so bad. Uh, in grade 12, was there like two teams, senior team, junior team, or like, or one team to the school? Team. Okay. It was varsity, um, varsity, junior varsity. Okay. So and you were horrible? Yeah, I was so bad. What'd you play? Play corner. Okay. Play so you've corner. always been on that side? Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, no, no. I lied. I play receiver. Okay. Start off playing receiver. And horrible. For, uh, for the Brampton Bulldogs, yeah. Why, why are you so bad? <laughs> it's like, because you, you didn't know what to do. Dude, or? there was times I would catch the ball in my brain. Like, like you know, you run around, Which you way? catch the ball, and, you know, you catch the ball and you realize, <laughs> dude, they're coming after me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now being hunted. So you're like, I'm going down. <laughs> Miles <Just> Turtle. <laughs> I run out of bounds, you know. <laughs> One time I caught a ball and this guy messed me up bad. Like he, I had bad ribs, you know. And after I remember asking the coach, I was like, what position did that guy play? He was like, he plays as a safety. 
next uh, next year uh, tryouts, I'm like, yep, I'm playing safe. <laughs> you want to deliver. Yeah. You don't want to receive it. I was like, I never once wanted to make me feel like that ever again. <laughs> it felt bad. I went home, I had no, no appetite. Like coughing hurt, laughing hurt. You know, I was like, man, he really gifted. <laughs> and I was like, that's that's what I want to do to people, you know, and mm-hmm. that's where. And then this football thing was kind of crazy because I was so bad at it. And then what my sister said to me about being passionate and directing your energy. So now I had a a challenge. Yep. You know, I was good at soccer. Basketball came easy, I'm naturally fast. Track was easy. Yep. So it was not really a challenge. So for me. I finally had something that I was like, oh my God, this is this is tough. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was skinny, underdeveloped kid, just mm-hmm. didn't get the game, didn't get the rules. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just, and then there was the 2004 playoffs when I watched the Eagles and um, Don McNabb, Michael Vick being the first two black quarterbacks to face each other in a NFC Championship game to go to the Super Bowl. That. I'm sitting there, so I, this is my fresh, fresh in Canada, right? So. And this is this is how football subconsciously has been in my mind, right? So I'm watching this game, not understanding anything, but I just I was so blown away how the commentators were so yep. enamored by the First fact time. that these two right. So I was just like, this football thing's kinda of weird. It's trippy. <laughs> and then just followed it, followed it, and then I got to the point where, you know, I seen it in school, mm-hmm. you know, it comes back, you know, mm-hmm. and then trying out when I finally tried out for safety, it came natural. You know, just, being, a, being a midfielder in soccer and being a safety is really similar things. Yep. You know, you never let the ball get over your head. Yep. So when they put me in safety, it was just like riding a bike. Everything just clicked? Just clicked. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so grade 12 receiver. So after you graduate, then what are you doing for ball? Like <sighs> after high school, what do you like? So I had no options. So Because school was not your jam. School, my number. So I had to go to CJ. I had to find another option to keep. So I messed up because if I had known I needed school, with football, then I would have directed that energy into school. Yep. So when I was done, I realized I had no offers. And so I was like, I got to go to another, you know. Like a prep kind on, of thing? Yeah. Okay. Just, just to kind of get, I need, I needed to learn to be a better student. Mm. You know, I need to find out how I can become a better student so I can keep playing football. Because now I was interested in football. Yep. So, yeah. So you go to this like prep. Prep school, you go to Siege Up. Yep. That's, that's why I said all my boys in Brampton, we all kind of moved. Yep. So eight of us went to Siege Up. You know? Did they have a team too? Yeah. So Champlain, Cougar, kind of, Champlain Cougars. So it's like in between high school, it's not university. It's like yeah. A, like a, it's like a Siege Up. So in, in uh, Quebec, they don't have grade 12. Okay. So it stops with grade 11 and then Siege Up, then university. Okay. So I just went there. Gotcha. And um, yeah, Coach John, sorry, shout out to Coach Jonkas. Uh, Coach Jonkas walk came. Walk on? Um, pretty much, man. He's just, I don't think I ever showed him tape. Um, one of my friends was at Bishop's and then he was talking to him about finding talent. So he said, I have these young guys in Brampton that are finishing high school and they only have options. So he drove down and it was about four or five of us. Um, one of the guys played for BC Lions, Steve Natakulu, um, Rylan Smith, tried off, I think he tried for the Alouettes. So all of all, we were just sitting there, we're talking to him and I was like, man, listen, I'm going. Because now I love football and there's no point you to play football in a different province, mm-hmm. right? And I get another shot to make right with school. Yep. So, so it all made sense. It's like the, it was the perfect spot to perfect go spot. figure it out. Right. And then, yeah. So you get there. How long are you there for? You figure it out for a couple of years? In Quebec? Yeah. In uh, CJ. So I was there the first year. And then all the guys that I went with had. Uh, a pretty good crew though, right? Yeah. They you just had, like shouted out three that like right. went to a high right. level. Went to a high level. So these guys all got offers. And they went to, because they had the grades. To yeah, see, yeah. So that's the thing when when they come to look at you. Yep. Okay, he's a good player. What's his grades like? Mm-hmm. Terrible grades. Can't get him in a program. Mm-hmm. All right. Off the afterthought. Yep. We'll focus on these guys. Yep. So I'm looking. I don't have any options, and I'm like, okay, I'll come back and play another year. CJ went back to the spring camp, killed it, but felt like a, I was too big, I was too grown, mature to play. Mm. So I took the only offer I had, McGill. Shout out to Coach. Uh, Utley and Sonny Wolf, you know, they they saw a talented kid and they gave me a shot. Uh, um, the only offer. The only offer. So they, they took a flyer on you? Took and a like, flyer on me. And mm. then, yeah. And then, you know, couldn't even get into the program I wanted. So did uh, continuing education for yeah. accounting. I finally got my grades up. Finally learned how to be a good student. The student thing, like, chased, like, chased you for a while, right? Yeah. Just because. Yeah. Like, was it um, you weren't into it? 
your your head couldn't like just. I'm asking you because I was horrible too. I wasn't motivated. That's for school. I didn't find like, I mean, you didn't see the use for it. You didn't understand. The, <laughs> I knew how to study yeah. to pass an exam. Okay, when I was in McGill, I knew a lot of kids didn't know how to pass, like write an exam and pass an exam. But a yeah. lot of times when I talk to these kids, I can't, I can't really connect with them because, you know, they spend all day in a cubicle yep. studying for X amount of hours because of how hard school is in McGill. Yep. So for me, I had to get out of that environment. You know, I because I'm a person, I'm an outgoing guy. You know, I I can't be in the library all day. Mm-hmm. You know, like school was just never really something that I like. Cause, cause I needed, I needed school with football. Yep. I kind of tolerated school. Yep. Well, it wasn't something I was like, man, I'm trying to get A's. I'm just trying to get enough to be able to play next year. Right. Meanwhile, you got this sister. Who's just blowing and then my, just walking. Now my little sister's on, um, she's a, she's on the 30 for 30 list for sustainability and something. <laughs> right. So it's like, there's just, there's scholars in my family. I don't know. For some reason, I think. Being around that for so like uh, all my life, yeah. I kind of went a different path. Mm-hmm. My dad would buy books. I'm like, why are you buying books? Buy games. <laughs> like it was just that. It was just. Like, Can we get a Monopoly box. Like, <laughs> what are these books? <laughs> I had a bookshelf, and I'm like, what are these books? <laughs> I'm going outside. <laughs> I'm going outside. <laughs> so, yeah. Tired of being inside reading. And my huh? sisters love reading. They read all day. Did the school thing, you know? Before we got on camera, like you went back and graduated. Yeah. So you figured it out, right? Like there's a. I figured it out when uh, I met my I met my wife. Yep. And I realized I'm gonna have kids. We're, we're talking about having kids one day. Mm. They're gonna they're gonna come to a point where they're gonna be like, I don't want to go to school. She has a university degree. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, we're not gonna be on the United Front. <laughs> Got, right. Dad kids, kids, like, are so, kids are so smart. Well, dad, you didn't go to school. You didn't go to university. You have no, so why do I have to do it, right? So yeah, I'm kind of thinking, I'm like, all right. And then my mom, she's like, the only reason we brought you to Canada is for you to have a better education. So I need you to complete it and get a piece of paper to show me that what my sacrifice is complete. When did she say that to you? When I left home at 18. No way. Yeah. It was kind of one of those like. Listen. You need to finish your degree. Interesting. You need to finish. Mm-hmm. You need to finish. I don't mm-hmm. care what you do. You need to finish. And so when I transferred to University of Calgary, I had to restart my whole program. And why did it, why did you leave McGill to come to Calgary? <sighs> Bunch of things, but it was like better opportunity out here, or a different opportunity, or just like got got um, school got in the way again. Mm-hmm. And CJ, I didn't pass enough classes. Gotcha. To be able to play at McGill. Gotcha. But they thought so. My my government name is Annie Abed Adam. It means who's like God, which is what well, Michael means. That same meaning, Michael. So the lady that was doing the student forums at McGill thought Michael Edom and Annie Abed Edom were two different people. They thought we were brothers, but it was me. Because I was signing some forms Annie and I was signing some forms Mike. Just, just me just being a yeah, floozy yeah. kid, just, yeah, yeah. you know, not knowing. So I played five games into the McGill season and yep. then the coach called me. He's like, yeah, you weren't supposed to be playing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so I'm kind of like, oh, okay. And he's like, yeah, so we have to sit you down for the season. So I was like, he's like, but you can practice for the team. So I was like, okay. So I'm practicing, you know, just, and then that's how you know I love football because I'm practicing. Yeah. I'm not playing. All the reps. But I'm not even, no going, I'm not even going to class. <laughs> like, I'm just like waking up and going to, I'm waking up and going, oh my God. I'm waking up and just going to football, you know, and it's just like. Bro. <sighs> yeah, man. Mm-hmm. And then. So, when, how, so how did Calgary? So a friend of mine, Jesse Zimmer, he, his dad, he was a McGill with me. His dad brought him back home. He, you know, Blake Neal recruited him, got him on the, on the team. So. Yep. He's playing Xbox Live with one of my teammates at McGill when I'm so I took a year off to get by school yep. in order so I could have Still an option. Still chasing it. Still chasing it. And this is when I figured out that I needed because now I wanted to get out of McGill. I was gonna say haunting, but I didn't want to like I didn't want to like cry. and then you said I was like, oh It was my like the God. monkey on my back. Yeah, okay. So you know, so I'm like summer in McGill, you know, a whole year, no no football, because I couldn't play. Mm-hmm. I really figured out who I was as a student. My problem was showing up. It wasn't like I was a, and that's the thing, I always thought I was a dumb kid. It's not because I was a dumb kid. I just didn't apply myself enough. Mm. You know, like for me, it was easier. School was actually easier for me when I figured out that if I listen, my, maybe not necessarily take notes, if I listen, I can retain a lot. Mm. 
That's your way. Yes. Mm. If I just listen, I can retain a lot. So if I just show up to class and sit there, I would actually retain more as opposed to if I didn't go and I say I'm gonna cram, I'm gonna cram for two weeks. Yeah. So believe it or not, just showing up to class, I was getting C plus, B minuses now. Mm. And then add that with a little bit of study time. Yep. Getting You're there. B's, getting B's now. I'm mm. figuring out school. So when I came to University of Calgary, I came like I guess a complete student now. Yep. I was ready for that challenge yep. of being in uh, higher learning and mm -hmm. you know in that position. Did they um when when you come to Calgary, do they, do they say you have a spot or you come to tryouts and see what happens? So I came for a spring camp. Okay. And um, yeah, Coach Neal just kind of, you know, watched me. And then as I was uh, driving, he's driving me to the airport. You know, he's got this form, you know, commitment form. He's got it on the dashboard. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at it. You know, he's not really saying much. No way. <laughs> yeah, he was just driving. <laughs> and I was like, is that a commitment form? He's like, you don't have to sign it. Just, you know, think about it. I already knew I was, was going to be here mm -hmm. because now I'm in Calgary. And the one thing, when I came to Calgary and I saw how talented the players were. Yep. Because he was, he was a, he's known for like recruiting. Right, for and like recruiting. I saw how talented the team was. I was like, man, this, these are all the lines I want to run with. You yep. know, when I was at McGill, not to say there weren't necessarily lines out there, it was just more guys focused on, you know, these are the doctors, the McGill producers, the doctors and yep. the lawyers and the accountants of the world, right? So yep. these guys are more focused on, school than more sports. You know, I had guys talking about their engineering circuit boards at practice and that, like, that it take me off. And I'm like, dude, we've lost how many games in a row? Like, mm -hmm. You know, so I knew like, okay, I need to go to a program that was more football oriented or at yep. least I had a program that if I was part of, I can be myself and not be this recruiting class that's supposed to save the mm -hmm. program, right? Mm -hmm. So loved it. And right away. I, but yeah. but even like coming here, like you're still kind of like football is still pretty new, right? Yeah. Like yeah. To start playing CIS yeah. with whatever three, four, or five years in experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was tough. My first game, <sighs> my first game in Calgary was rough. <laughs> it was bad. Started? Were you starting? Yeah. yeah. A boundary half got hurt. Dal Kasama, you got hurt, so they put me a boundary half. And I remember the receiver from um, UBC Thunderbirds bets. Uh, I wish I remember his first name. His last name was Betts, number seven. <laughs> <sighs> it's so good you can remember this stuff. Well, this, this guy. <laughs> Haunt you. <laughs> man, I still have PTSD from that game. Like he, that worked? He might have run every route on me in the book. No way. Open. Quarterback was just feeding him. He must have had 10 catches at halftime or something crazy like that. I remember after the game, I went home, <laughs> grabbed my Bible, and I was like, God, <laughs> this football thing's for real. <laughs> I'll still be starting next week. <laughs> <laughs> the coaches still have enough faith in me to put me out there because what, what happened today was atrocious. <laughs> Dude, it was bad. And then, you know, go to next week and Coach Nell's like, you know what? We're just going to send you. I'm just going to blitz you. We'll make it easy for you. You're just, fast. You can run. Just get there. Just get there. And they just... And then as, this, as the season went on, I learned. Yeah, I learned. And that was the first time, you know, when I was in McGill, they kind of like let me be an athlete. Let me be, you know, I can play any technique I wanted and, you know, press up on a guy. And they yep. kind of, I'll play man and play zone around, you know, allowed me to be myself a little bit, right? Yep. But when I came here, I had to learn how to play off coverage and all these different things, you know? And it was like, to make it harder on me. Just let me, let me, let me press and run. Yep. And Coach Marcello repeating was like, you can't turn everything to attract me. Sure enough, that game, you know, we get in the game, I, I throw all technique out the window and I'm like, man, I'm gonna do this thing my way. And this guy gives me the business. Bad. No way. Bad. But it allowed me, you know, it let me know that, okay, if you wanna play football, yep. you gotta, it's time to, you know, focus. Mm -hmm. That summer I didn't go home. Mm. I stayed. I stayed here, and that's when me and CY moved in together. In no way. Yeah. And and your idea to stay here was just to like zero in on like study study football or what was it or just train. It, differently? it was it was to be around football, mm. be around the facility, be able to go in and see my coach. Yeah. Be able to go in and talk to people. Um, working out. I needed to put on some size, some yep. weight. I was a little skinny, you know. Um, training, growing as a person. Yep. You know, not. <laughs> Not going home and being in mom's house and mom's roof and, you know, being still could be pretty like yeah. good food. It's, it's comfortable, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no. Because um, I started seeing guys. Well, that was my first um, 
going through the draft process and seeing guys move on to the next level. Was that, I was just going to ask you that. Was that, was that even on your radar? No, not at all. Like not even like, no, you're like, there's, there's no, no, this is, that's we not used to go, world. we used to go watch a uh, pinball play. Oh yeah. As a high school, we mm -hmm. go as a football team yep. and you know, I knew about the CFL, but in terms of me wanting to play, no. University still not on the, on the radar. Wasn't even on the radar. Okay. My, that year, my, um, 2012, I wasn't on the radar. And, um, I remember when the bureau list came out, there's a bureau list that comes out with the top 50 players yep. at the start of the season. When my name wasn't on there. So I was like, well, <laughs> Hey, that's Maybe it. Next I, year. <laughs> right. And that, but, but that, that summer I had said to myself, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to work out. I'm going to get better. And I'm going to give myself the best fighting chance with this football thing. Cause I just saw the draft process guys and I started looking at contracts, mm. started seeing money that mm -hmm. was possible of making, mm -hmm. and, you know, playing pro. And, um, you know, Henry Burst was in town at the time and, you know, he became a mentor for me. Mm. You know, a few times I saw him out in Calgary, you know, he'd pull me aside, you know, and talk to me, you know. Yep. So. Just like, uh, just to kind of answer questions and be a, just, just be right. approachable, yeah. just kind of be around. Just kind of be around, you know, just learn the city. Yep. And I kind of felt like I didn't really know my teammates. You know, I, I won't lie, um, I was a little bit of a, uh, I was a tough teammate to be around when I was younger. Um, just too like in your head or too like? Too like in my head, just, you know, just. Just like immature? Yeah. You know, they want to listen to authority. Mm. You know, didn't like people telling so I get me. To me. I got to yeah. worry about it. Right. Yeah. And uh, Lyndon Gatos, you know, shout out to Lyndon. He was uh, one of the guys I really, you know, you know, him, Sam Hurl. You know, I got in a fight with my teammate one time, Sam Hurl, kind of, you know, talking there, talking to him. And he was like, dude, you seem like you're always running from your problems. You know, you ran mm. from CJ, you know, you ran from McGill. Like, because I was talking about quitting and going back home. I'm like, I'm done with the team. I'm going back home. You're hot. He was like, yeah, he's like, you can quit and go back home. We're just going to be doing the same thing. And then that summer, you know, I got moved to linebacker. So now I'm playing behind Linden. And believe it or not, he made me earn it. You know, he was the leader on the team at that time. And I was a new guy coming in. Mm. You know, there were guys that probably should have been in that role before I was. And I don't know why Chris Neal put me there. He must have saw something. Mm -hmm. So the guys made me earn it. And that was for, for the first time I felt connected with my teammates because after training camp that there, there was a house party, a rookie hit party. Now I wasn't going to go because I didn't feel like I was one of the guys, right? And then Linda came up to me and he was like, I know some bullshit. Can I? Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're in a safe place. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> he was like, uh, yeah, I know there's some bullshit going on, you know. And, you know, I know you're having a hard time adjusting, but just I want you to be at the house party. It's my house. No one's going to mess with you. Come through and we're mm. going to start this thing off right this year. Mm. You know, I don't want you to feel left out. You're part of the team. You've earned your spot like a man coming through and, you know. Cool. So that was my first acceptance, I guess. He he, he was like. Yeah. He was, that, that was a big right? dog. You know, yeah, Lyndon yeah. was like the number one. He was the first overall pick. You know, that was a big dog at the time, right? Mm. So for me to get his kind of like stamp of approval, yeah. I was like, okay, now I owe it to my teammates for me to make sure that. I pan out because, yep. you know, one thing about Lyndon, he probably hated this because they put in, Coach Neil put in something called a bank call. So a bank call pretty much tells me I can put Lyndon in a B gap right now if I feel threatened. <laughs> so we played a three down front, right? And Lyndon was usually lined up, head up the tackle. So he'd always told me to stack Lyndon, but if I wanted to make sure that no one reached me and I just played C gap and everything outside, make a bank call, throw that 300 pound man in the B gap. And I know Lyndon hated this because his stats, <laughs> and, and this is why I always love Lyndon because he, his stats went down drastically after he put the bank call in. <laughs> and it was because my first time playing, I've never played linebacker, on the side of linebacker, right? So the first time the guard reaches me, it just digs me in the dirt. So I'm like, <laughs> Lyndon's dusting me off, you know, he's just, it's okay. <laughs> it's all right. So, you know, Coach Neil puts the bank call in the next game. Bang, bang, bang. It's like second and... 20, he's like, could you not call the bank call? Cause I, was, I just want to be able to pass for it. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, all right, no bank call. He's like, it's pass, you know, it's not run. The guard's not gonna come up to you, okay? You don't have to make a bank call. So, you know, so that, yeah. He's, he, that was a turning point. That was a turning point. So going into that next year, like what happened through that year? I just had a crazy year. You performed? Yeah. Guys you around, just, I just, it clicked. And you got comfortable with yourself, your surroundings. Was able to, was better time management with school. Yep. Was invested. Yep. I had um, Sandra Wiggs. She was um, a academic advisor with the program at the time. She really like helped me learn how to write papers. Mm. 
And then I mean, now I'm in communications, right? Not accounting. So now I'm really learning how to express myself. Yep. Right. So I understand who I am better as a student. You know, I'm able to communicate now and tell, talk to my teammates about things that are bothering me. Yep. You know, as opposed to just shutting down until you explode. Yeah. Right. So hard. I'm learning, I'm getting becoming just become a better person. Mm -hmm. Right. So it all came around full circle. Interesting. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. That that story, that was like that moment. Yeah. Was a big kind of like trigger. it just like when you have when you have a coach that believes in you. Yep. Like he always saw it. when uh, we had scouts come in. Like I was in the hallways, and then he pulls me by my ear. He's like, "Get in here!" And throws me in the room, and then it was Drew Arlington, was a recruit for Hamilton Tigers. He's like, uh, "This is Mike." You know, he can be a pain in the butt sometimes, but you know, he's about six foot, <laughs> about one ninety. He can run real well. If you just take your time with him, you know, he can. He, he might be able to pan out and be something decent in the CFL. Mm -hmm. You know, so when he did that, I was like, like, this might be reality. Yeah, I was all like, of a sudden it's on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after that season, um, I think I was placed number 42 okay. on the bureau list now. Remember yep. we started season, I wasn't so you're on, on the list. list. Yes, now I'm on the list number 42. I remember working at Home Depot, um, working at Home, uh, Home Depot, going in, and they had the the news clip yep. cut out on the bulletin with board. With you? Yeah. With your name on it? Yeah. Awesome. So, like, um, Northfield Home Depot. And so they kind of showed me that, like, it was like a family atmosphere they kind of like you know mm -hmm. they were proud of me you know mm -hmm. i was like oh man i got people looking out for me like this is crazy mm -hmm. so then you know one of the one of the older, older ladies i worked there she was like she, she was like she's like i hope you're not satisfied with 42. <laughs> what right right you know what i'm saying she was just like i hope you're not satisfied with 42. this is a lunch room and i'm just like hmm what are you talking about she's like everyone's saying congratulations because you're number 42 out of 50. that's not really a good thing <laughs> Wow. Believe it or not. <laughs> she's like, I don't take it as a person to settle for that. So now she's saying all this. I'm like, I mean, she has a point. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of slid in there. Right. So it's like in my head, right? So going through a process of combine training, my whole thing was to get myself ready to jump that list. Mm -hmm. So I think when it's all said and done, I went into the combine at number 10. Yep. And... Yeah, after the combine, I went from moved from forty two to number ten on the list. I think you're ready, and then I got drafted third overall. Third overall, yeah, no way. Yeah, what year was that? Two thousand thirteen. Crazy. Yeah. So like, high. Like, who? <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's good. Yeah. So then what? You get drafted. You're like, by Montreal. Yeah, I'm like, I'm excited because. How old are you when this is happening? Twenty three. Okay. I'm excited because it's an opportunity for me to. You know, really play pro football yep. and make some money. Mm -hmm. And um, so, sorry, what is your what is it? What do your parents say and and your brilliant sister or sisters when you get drafted? What does that conversation look like? They, f I think they finally realized that everything I was doing out west, yep, was was for something. Mm. I wasn't out here. You weren't running. You no. were actually like getting it, rude. Whatever he, whatever happened in Calgary, has made him. A better person yeah right like whatever he's been through mm -hmm. has made him understand the things he needs to do so my sister she started talking to me as a, she started talking to me as a you know a mutual yep like we are like high achiever yeah 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 because you know she's a you know when you're in that line of work you got to be carry yourself in a certain way and i mm -hmm. feel like up to that point she always seen me as that little brother that i have to look out for yeah i always have to keep yeah, he's in shit, doing whatever. right i was out to make sure he's you know on the up and up and then my little sister even got to the point where she was like even telling me like you gotta do better and I, you know when you listen to, like, right when you listen to telling you that and then you know i finally get drafted and kind of see them you know kind of be like they're, they're proud of me you know mm -hmm. I, I see my little sister come to talk she came to my game you know i was playing in montreal and she brought her friends and i gave her tickets and she's like that's my big brother you know mm -hmm. That that moment it was mm -hmm. so surreal because mm -hmm. like we were kids in Nigeria and now we've we've come here and dude you know and I'm finally yeah, I, just got, I just got goosebumps I'm finally doing something for myself right they they're like okay he's figured it out like mm. we're so happy for him so for me when I got in the league I was like the average Canadian plays three years yep right yeah I was like that's not gonna be enough because I gotta do something great yep you know because my my parents have done so much for me you know we so we bought my parents a house. My first year, me and my sister pulled money together, bought cool. my parents a house. Everything I earned my first year went into that. Crazy. You know, and, you know, 
it was, it was such a we bought my mom a car, helped, helped my dad get a new car. It was like I was finally giving back yep. to the people that made the ultimate sacrifice for me. That's why you knew three years wasn't going to cut it. It wasn't going to cut it. I needed, needed to I, needed, I needed more to just keep yep. keep on keeping yep. on, right? Yep. On the right track. So, you know. And then luckily enough, like I said, you know, earlier I said, you know, young guys, you have to let them be themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the most fortunate things about playing for the Alouettes my first year. All those guys I mentioned, the Tisdale, the Gerald Brown, the Marco Bruyette, you know, the Chip Cox, the Kyrie Say Bear, the By uh, Billy Parker, the Byron Parker. These guys all played six, seven, eight years and up, right? Mm -hmm. But they let me be myself. I remember one time I was talking trash to the fans on our sideline, and then somebody grabbed me and was like, hey, Rook, don't. And then Chip was like, no, leave him alone. He's making plays. He can say whatever the fuck he wants. <laughs> so he's being him, right? So he's like looking after me, and that's my first time Chip Cox ever like saying anything positive towards me. Mm. You know, so mm -hmm. I was like, went back to talk. <laughs> I'm alive, <laughs> right, right. And then it was kind of neat because I would see other guys come in and not necessarily get that treatment. Maybe not necessarily because you know the guys around makes it who they are. They're more reserved introverts. Yeah. So you know them allowed me to be myself really allowed me to have success my first year. Mm. But the thing about success is, as fast as you can get success, it can be taken away from you so fast. From somebody coming up, injuries, whatever, like? No, from the man in the mirror. Mm. We can be our own worst enemies with success because like, we start patting ourselves on the back. Yeah. We start, we don't, we don't realize that, hey, there was a lot of things that got, and Coach Neal had to be there. Yep. Jesse Zimmer had to help me yep. get from Miguel. You yep. know, all these things had to happen for me mm -hmm. to be able to have success. It mm -hmm. wasn't because I was just a great player off the mm -hmm. bat. If that was the case, I would have been in the NFL mm -hmm. and I would have gone, mm -hmm. you know? So I started thinking, no, this is me. Like, you did? Yeah. So you Oh, know, it got twisted for a bit? I started talking back to the coaches, you Oof. know? And I don't think I've ever told anyone this. That's probably why I left Montreal. Because the coach, see, think about it. When a coach puts you on the field, that's how he feeds his family. That's his livelihood. Mm -hmm. So he has to be able to trust you to put you out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He has to be able to trust you to understand what he's trying to do and accomplish. And you're going to abide by that. But yeah. when you start going against the grain, doing your own thing, and you know now the vets are speaking up on it because it's affecting how they're doing their job because mm -hmm. also their livelihood's on the line. Yeah, totally. They got kids, right? Yep. And you know, you start talking back to coaches, you know, it doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got, I got pulled from the starting lineup my first year in Montreal. And a week later, I won Rookie of the Year and Canadian of the Year for Montreal. And I was an all-star, but I was still on the bench. That sat with me for so long. I was like, mm. I'm benched, but mm -hmm. I'm winning athletes. Mm -hmm. the, like, it doesn't make any sense. I don't think any athletes have ever experienced that, being benched, but you're winning athletes while yep. you're being benched, right? Yeah. So that was my first time really realizing, like, okay, the pro game is different. You know, like get in line and like there's a bigger picture. Right, right. It's not about you anymore. Like, yeah, you were drafted third overall, but guess yeah. what? The next year they had a new draft class come in. So yeah. you're like an afterthought now. Mm -hmm. You have to keep, mm -hmm. you know, this is a business of what you've done for me lately. Yeah. You have to keep producing. So for me, it was kind of like, okay. You could figure it out line. though, hey? Yeah. Like get in line. Get in line. Hmm. You know, and then I sat patiently, sat patiently. And when I finally got traded to Hamilton, I had figured it out. So when I went to Hamilton, Hamilton was probably the most fun I've had playing football. No way. In terms of I've just played loose and free. Because you were comfortable with everything, like going. Yes, I was. I was. Like, I was two hours away from my mom's house. Mm. My friends I grew up with around. Mm. All my my high school coaches are at the games. Cool. You know, I was. I was. I was free. I was comfortable. So, I, and then I learned from um, being on the coach. Oh, I learned how to study film. I learned how to be a pro. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things he always talked about when we watch film, receiver would catch a ball for five yards. It's an average play. And you better why he's celebrating. And then when he comes to the defensive side, if you like made the tackle after a guy caught the ball, why are you celebrating? That's an average play. One time he was like, you know, getting a thousand yards in the CFL is not that hard. If you just average 50 yards a game, you can get a thousand yards. So now what he's doing is putting how to be great in perspective, really putting it in perspective for mm -hmm. me. So I'm like watching film. So some of the tape and plays I'm making, I'm like, well, that's that's an average player. It's just, it's, I should make that player. Yeah, that's, that's what you're here yeah. to do. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, so now I'm like, okay, I understand the game. I understand the league. I understand the game. I'm learning. I hit free agency, scary times. Because you have no, 
you don't know how anything is going to go. Scary <clears throat> times. I mean, scary. And this is like two years in? It's three years in. Three years. Yeah. Two Montreal. To uh, um, three Montreal, my, my third year in Montreal, the last six games I went to Hamilton. Gotcha. And then we had that playoff run to Hamilton. And I just, and I saw how guys work together, you know, like, just like the way they watch film. They did bring them in at 830, did watch film. After practice, we stayed back, watch film, you know, mm. made sure everything we did for the day was, so when we came in the next day, it was a fresh slate. Why, what do you think, what do you think it was with that group? Why the extra? Like, why is that so different? The guys. Well, I, I don't want to say the guys that won it in Montreal, because we did want it. Yeah. When I when it was in Hamilton, you know, they just got the new stadium. The team, mm. the team was in the up and up, right? Yep. So the energy. The energy was was good. It was right. And mm. honestly, I was like they were just and they they cared for one another. Mm. You know, they you know, they looked out for one another. So it was kind of neat to be part of that, yep. even though and the way they accepted me, even though I came in at the end of the season, they just, yeah, right. shout out to my boy, Courtney Stevens. He really helped that transition go smooth, smoothly it, for me. It could have been rough, right? Could have been rough. Dude, one day I'm sitting at practice in Montreal. I'm practicing in Montreal. And the next day I'm wearing black and gold. <laughs> Different. Different. <laughs> Crazy. Um, <clears throat> what happened? How long were you in Hamilton? Six games. Six games? Yeah. Maybe just a two tail. playoffs. Yeah. And then where'd you go? BC. Huh. Oh. Uh, just free agency? Free agency. Okay. Yeah. Wally, playing for Wally. That was that was a fun experience. Like? That was, uh, you know what? He kind of made me realize whatever you've done in the past doesn't matter. You got to keep producing. Hmm. Like, oh, Wally was on you. Relentless? Oh, man. <laughs> on you. No way. But. How did you react to that? At first... I was a little bit against it. Yep. I get your like. Yeah. But then as the season was going on, I saw the guys that was that had success under him. And everyone was like, man, he was like that with me. Mm. So I kind of started figuring it out. Mm -hmm. But then one thing led to another. I got traded. And, and that was probably one of the most humbling times talking to my agent. And he's just like, dude, you bounced around a few times. I'm going to be honest with you. You need to stop acting like people owe you something. You need to get your shit together. Like he's like, you have so much talent, but you're so in your head, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I wonder if you really care about football. So you know, and it's crazy. Never ask your phone. <laughs> Never ask your phone <laughs> speaker when your agent calls and, you, and your woman's in the bed. Cause we, oh God! Because so he gave me this lash on the phone. My girl's like, ooh, that's not ooh. what you tell me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm kind of like, oh my God, okay. Where'd it's it's kind of like that conversation my sister had with me. Yeah. Are you passionate Passion, about something? Yeah. And that's why I appreciate these relationships I have with certain people because they they tell me what I need to hear, mm -hmm. not what I want to hear. Yeah, the honesty. And that's why they're my role models. Mm -hmm. So when that we had that conversation, I kind of like, okay. And then I got traded to, to SAS. And the thing is, I had a chance to sign with SAS when I was in free agency. It was SAS and BC mm -hmm. that had contracts on the table. Mm -hmm. And... I, was, I didn't want to play for Jones because I was like, man, he looks like a hard ass. I see him on TV cussing guys out. I'm like, no, nah, I don't need that. <laughs> I can't go there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I already don't like. <laughs> but then I got here and it was just a college like atmosphere, the vibe he had created. Yeah. His ass, it was it was nice. And then one of the coaches that really, Coach Dickey, Coach Dickey said something to me in my first two weeks probably in camp. You know, he pulls me aside. He's like, you're not as bad as everyone talks about. Like the, you were, you were. He's a special teams coordinator. And but there was something chasing you. Yeah. There was like there was a tag on there's, you. There's that was a, like there's, going a there's a aura or yep. there's a stigma. Yep. About you that you know it's in the league and you know. It's a it's a small league. Yeah. Bad news travels mm -hmm. extremely fast. Mm -hmm. You know, so all these situations talking back to the coach. You know, yep. you probably partying a little bit too much in Montreal, going out. You yep. know, gets around mm -hmm. and then. So when I got to SAS, I said, this might be my last chance. You were like, right. this is like a switch. It's, it's going to be my last chance. And even going there, I already didn't want to go there because I knew I had to rotate what's on at safety. I wasn't going to be the starter. Mm. I had to, you know, strip playing time. Yep. So I had to humble myself. Mm -hmm. I really had to humble myself and say, okay, I'm really going to be competing for a spot now. Like, this might be it. If you don't win that spot, 
Like you already have a bad aura about you. You yep. might not be able to get a job again. Yep. So and, and d- does these thoughts does it go back to like knowing that the average Canadian is three years and that you know you got the family things to get that you want to accomplish? Are you are these occupying? Is it in your brain when you're trying to like make a good decision? No, because now, so I'm like, so I got the big contract in BC. So now I'm making a little bit of money. I'm okay. seeing what football can really open yep. up doors for you. Yep. You know, so I'm like, I just paid my student loan off. So I'm damn it, debt free. You're good, yeah. So I'm like, okay, I need to find a way to make this work so I can keep doing this as long as possible because this is awesome. I get six months off. Yep. I get paid you know, yep. pretty well. Yep. I need to do this as long as possible. So, do you still love the sport when you get to Sask? I loved it even more because mm. Jones's system was so different from what I've done. Remember, I told you I'm in Guild and let me play man to man, kind of be myself. Yeah, just be athletic. So I finally came back to that system, not so much technique based, just play fast. Because mm. Jones is a fast guy, play mm. fast, you know. And he's, he's an awesome coach. He came up to me one time and he's like, um, he's like, um, actually no, sorry, it's a drift. I'm telling the Coach Diggy story. Yes, so, sorry. So, I, yeah. I told you about no, it. Let me finish. Let me finish the Coach Diggy story. So two weeks in, my retirement in SAS, Coach Diggy comes up to me. He's walking back to the dorms. I'm walking to the lunch. I capture. He goes, uh, he goes, you're not as half as bad as people talked about. Like, you know, I heard some pretty shitty things about you. He's like, you're all right. You're, you're all right to me. Just keep doing what you're doing. And everything will work itself out. And he was special teams coordinator. And I was like, okay. So from then on, I'd always go hard on special teams because I knew, like, this guy, mm-hmm. this guy's making his decision about me based on his interaction with me, not yep. listening to what other people are saying about me. Yep. Lee, because we are young, make mistakes, but people grow. Mm-hmm. You know, people mature. You know, and I think he saw that maturity, and I think that's why, even after he became a head coach, I've stuck around, and I think Jail kind of saw the same things in me because Jail's seen me in the building since I got there. He's seen me mature mm-hmm. over the years. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why this is like, I finally found a home. Mm-hmm. And then Riderville is just accepted. Different. Right, mm-hmm. right. You cannot play in Riderville and not, not want to stay. Well, yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm guessing, this is me talking out of my ass here, but if you're, if you're a, not a good person in Riderville, it's, it doesn't it, it, seem no, like it's gonna It's not gonna work. work. Yeah, It's not gonna work. Like, like the city's so small. Mm-hmm. Whatever you do will come out. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you get to Sask, you're at home, everything's like everything's, you know. New perspective. Have, have you changed over the years you've been there now? Or is it like you've been pretty consistent with your approach? I, I'm consistent with my approach, but made a few adjustments on the way. Like still growing. Still growing, yeah. Yep. Cause now I'm like, okay, I'm earning a living. I'm doing something I love, which is like stealing. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. Life's good. Yep. But now I see myself like starting to want more. Mm. I want a great cup. Mm. So when I got to SAS and, you know, people wrote us off, like, we're not going to do anything. So when we started finally winning, turn that program around, yep. and, you know, the, the playoff games, you know, losing, that drive becomes even, that, even more and more and more and more mm. and more. Like, you want that because that's that confirmation that you are the top of the pinnacle yep. of your game, right? Yep. Like you accomplished something not a lot of people get to accomplish. Mm-hmm. You know, I never won all Canadian in university, you know. So for me, winning a great cup would be, would, you know, I guess, put a stamp of approval that my parents brought me to Canada yep. and, you know, I became mm-hmm. a great cup champion. It's like it's like the ultimate loop, right? right. It's right. a crazy right. story. Right. Yeah. So, and, and, and that's what keeps me, that's what keeps me going right now and it's that, that, that drive for that championship. And the longevity? That like the know, longevity part is it's a <laughs> what is it is it is I don't it, I don't even think about it like that to be honest with you to be like ten years in which is a I just take it one year at a time mm-hmm. just like little windows it's, it's like for the media up. see see the media don't realize do you guys are the ones that say okay he's played ten years sometimes I don't even realize mm-hmm. so the other day my wife was like oh my god you played ten years you're getting old you know and I'm like yeah, you're right but I'm st- I, f- I feel good mm-hmm. you know I'm still doing what I love I still have a passion for the game so yeah. I'm just gonna keep you know, one year at a time. Like yep. you start trying to play, I'm play X amount of year. You don't know what God's got planned for you. Yeah. I'm just every day I get to get up and do the same thing. Every day I get to get up and do what I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. It's a blessing. It's lucky. Like Man, hell yeah. Like to, to not many people can say that in in, in any career, right? Like not it's, many people can say it. And then the thing about it too is, it opened doors for you. 
when you when you play as long as I have, it starts opening doors. You know, you start meeting people and yeah. connecting and really realize, okay, mm -hmm. football doesn't have to be over when I'm done. Yeah. I can leverage football mm -hmm. and still continue yep. with a passion. Of, you know, you don't have to lose a passion mm -hmm. because you're not playing. Doesn't mean you can't leverage football to mm -hmm. continue cultivating that passion. Mm -hmm. You know, you just gotta find a different avenue that you can do it at. Is that a recent aha for you? You know, like when you realize that football is opening up all these doors and like, right. is, it, is it when you got to Sask and this family kind of thing, mm -hmm. is that when it kind of started clicking? Yeah. Yeah. We all just started like, okay, start writing goals down, start making plans, start making five-year plans, you know. That's what's just, that's a serious task. Right. Right. You start making, you know, because you want to accomplish things. Yeah. As, but the thing about football is sometimes we get so wrapped up in I want to be great, and then we lose kind of ourselves in our, in our domestic lives. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing I never wanted to do. You know, that's why I, during the pandemic, I took time off and I really like addressed the domestic things in life. Like, you know, we bought a house, mm -hmm. put my own touches on the house, you mm -hmm. know, some landscaping work, built a deck, learned yep. how to build a deck with my brother-in-law. Good skill. You're right, just like, you know. Yep. Kind of like, just, you know, learning, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that, and that, that um during the pandemic, during that time off, you know, yeah, that's when I graduated. So you, got, you got a lot done. When the pandemic hit and it took and football was taken away, that was the first time I was, I was like, man, okay, there's no football. What am I going to do? Like, I, don't, I don't have my degree. And you're, but you're like, you're grinning right now. Yeah. But, but when that happened, the, the depression. Yeah. Like depression. ugly. My wife would go to work for the whole time she's at work. I'd be in the basement, blacked out the basement, just sitting there thinking, I didn't want to be outside, you know. The essence of who I am was football, right? It's taken away. And now I'm like, that's not like football is not who you are, Mike. Mm -hmm. Like, you come from a pretty, you know, strong family. Look at what mm -hmm. your sisters have done. Mm -hmm. I was like, I just haven't finished some of the things I started. So one thing I said was, okay, let's finish, let's finish a degree. Mm -hmm. I had five classes left. All right, I'm gonna load up. I've never taken four classes in the semester. So when we went, here we go. <laughs> taking five. I'm like, boy, let's see where this is gonna end up. <laughs> but then as you're doing it, as you're doing it, you know, I get to end of the semester and I'm like talking about graduation. It's kind of like trippy. And then, you know, I had a few classes, a few science classes that, you know, exams are tough and, you know, I didn't even check if I graduated or even check my, my past my mark. My wife checked the mail one day and she goes, there's a big envelope in here. I'm like, what is that? It's like from the University of Calgary. <laughs> it's my degree. <laughs> that was when you figured it out. And I was like, oh, I graduated. <laughs> I didn't even check my mark. I should have gone back and you know how you finished so, you know, I was like, you know what? I did my best, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. And that's how I found out. Uh, and did you call your mom? Oh, yeah. Like quickly, oh, yeah. She and what she said, cried on the phone. Yeah, yeah. She was like, like, that's. She was like, you know what she said? She's like, all right, now whatever I came to doing Canada's complete, which is heavy. Your sisters both have masters, doing great things. You now have a education. You've built a career for yourself. You know, you bought a house for yourself. You, you figured it out. Mm -hmm. You know, you starting to become the man we knew you would be. Because mm -hmm. there was a few times they were, they were worried about me. Just they going were, the wrong way. They were really worried. My mom used to cry a lot. She, mm -hmm. you know, she used to, sometimes she used to beat up on herself a little bit because she thought, because she babied me, I was mama's boy. She, you know. Yeah, yeah. But. It's all you. It was all me. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I know. So the pandemic was like, obviously torture, but there's a few wins in there that could right. be like. So when, you know, when you're in that state of mind, you know, you, you know, you see all your friends graduate, you know. People are doing, moving on to great things. Like it doesn't seem like football taking away has really hindered them. So it yeah. starts making you think, like, okay, yeah. I got to start putting wheels in motion for life after football. Mm -hmm. So you know, once I graduated, started timeout. Mm -hmm. You know, just it's not even something that I had planned to start while I was playing ourselves and do it when I'm done playing because I wanted to really be there for the kids, you know, all year round. You know, yep. and you know, we be really able to invest my time into the kids. Yep. But then when I started doing it, guys were like, my trainer Nick was like, you should do it, you should do it, you should do it. And then just the support I had from all my people in Calgary, like the the, the way people really showed me love. And I, you know, I had my first camp, it was, it was success. And last year we did the seven on seven thing, you know, this Get into year. it, get into timeout. Get into what, what, what at the root of it, what is, what is it? Timeout, um, I wanted to build like a mentorship program for young men. 
and um, you know help cultivate young young Canadian talent because the one the one thing about Canadian football American football is we don't have as much repetition as the guys up there do. The programs are not nearly comparable to the programs down south. Yeah, that's why you're now seeing a lot of Canadian kids going down south. You know, you see them going to camps. They're doing the seven on seven thing because they're trying to bridge that gap. You know, yep. get those reps to cultivate those skills. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do essentially, if I can help them, you know, like this year we rented out space and one of my wife's friends, her son was swung from running back playing receiver. So Ronnie and he hits me up and you know, they want, he wants to train with me and I'm like, okay, I can teach you football, but if we don't compete, we'll never understand. If I, if I don't get you in a position to compete and put those skills to, to test, yep. I don't really know if it's gonna help you out much. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, let's market a little bit. Let's get a bunch of other kids. Uh, and let's do it for five weeks. So we did that for five weeks every Sunday. Yep. And you know, you know, bought him, bought, bought him a pair of cleats, got him a pair of cleats. You know, just got him some guys to compete with him. You know, teaching the game, and it was crazy watching him grow. Even his mom was like, "My God, he's he looks like a receiver now." You know, and mm. it's it's gratifying. Is it? It's it's more than just skills, right? You talk to these kids about like, oh yeah, like all, all the all the tough lessons that you learned along the way, right? And you know what, the, the craziest things was, the biggest thing that, that always made me a better athlete was the person that was behind me, who was my biggest supporter. When I got to Calgary, Coach Nell, Marcello, Coach Wayne Harris, you know, these guys treated me like, Marcello was the Marcello, I don't know if you know Rapini, Marcello, Marcello Rapini. He was, he's the president of fifth quarter right now. Okay. He's a DB coach in Missouri, Calgary. He, I bumped heads with him a little bit. He's a he's a pretty high up in the oil and gas company. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not used to people telling him what to do. He's used yeah. to delegating. Yep. So you know, I had to find a way to humble myself so I can play underneath him. Mm -hmm. But when I did that, and he he started really like giving me life lessons. Cool. Life lessons. Mm -hmm. Like you remember him? Man, there was one. I saw so my run my first camp. I called him, and I'm like, man, I'm trying to find a way to set this thing up so I can make some profit, but not kill the kids' pockets. He's like, Mike, you got to you got to understand your variable costs and your fixed costs. He's like, this is going to carry you in life. So I'm just going to, instead of trying to help fund your camp, I'm going to tell you how to, I'm going to tell you something business-wise. So I cut, I cut my budget, you know, in, in the half. You know, I paid, instead of paying monetary devices, instead of paying my guys money, I said, okay, I know a few people were trying to sponsor, give me packages and mm -hmm. I'm gonna give to the guys, and, mm -hmm. you know pay for the field, pay for insurance. And I just, yep. I was able to do it with that. But he, his advice and the way things he kind of like, mm -hmm. people he connected me with yep. really helped, you know? So now I'm just, you know, waiting for, well, I'm just every off season, I'm going to do something with timeout. Yeah. Cool. But what it is, I don't know. Yeah, you know? it's just going to keep on growing. It's just going to keep on growing. Last year we did seven on seven. That was really fun. You know, this year I want to see if I can do it with timeout and hire, get someone else to run it for me. Mm. Cause I left last year and my team was ran by a few of my buddies. Yep. So I want to see if I can have them start running yep. the team and you know, doing what I did last year, just on the timeout. Mm -hmm. And once again, just, and then when I did it last year, like a bunch of my kids never played football. Like this is the first time playing football. Um, and just to see like them soak up everything you say mm -hmm. and you see them grow as players and then they're sending you like clips of them making plays awesome. during their season. You're awesome. like, oh my God, you know, and it's, it's, it's neat. Did you know, did you know the kid, like the kid, uh, you know, giving back to kids and working with kids would, would be a thing for you growing up? Or is this kind of a new, a new discovery? Um, it's, it's a new discovery because like I said, the older I've gotten, the younger players that I've come across, I've, I've gotten a chance to play with and I've kind of, yep. you know, helped them. It's neat to see players grow, mm -hmm. to see a guy go from a baby to, mm -hmm. you know, he comes in the league, you know, he gets beat on a few plays and all of a sudden he figures it out, it mm -hmm. clicks. Mm -hmm. And you see this monumental jump. Yep. And I think one of the biggest ones for me was uh, um, Nick Marshall. You know, Nick Marshall is one of my good friends on the team. He's one of those guys like Martin Kreef that when he came in, you know, I kind of, I was hard on Nick. You know, I didn't really like, <laughs> I didn't really talk. I, I didn't talk to Nick for the first. At least you know. <laughs> I didn't talk to Nick for the first. The whole camp, I didn't talk to Nate Marshall, and like, he was starting in the secondary. Do you do you make like a conscious decision not to talk to him? No, it's a situation that that presents itself. So they they bring him in, like, and 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 I should have I should have known who he was because I I watched him play, I, I watched him play um, quarterback in in school right for mm -hmm. Auburn. So when he moved to DB, I kind of didn't even remember he moved to DB. So yeah. when I saw Marshall on the depth chart as Team One first day of camp, I'm like, who's this guy? <laughs> Like he hasn't even had a damn camp the? yet. He's already in the first team. 
So I'm like, ah, whatever. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, you know, he's, he becomes really good. Like on the first day, like he's, I see why. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, let's get to the game and see if it translates. And then, you know, he gets in the game, he's making plays and, you know, he's now coming to me with questions and I'm answering his questions. Yep. And then, you know, getting to know him, but I realized he's a cancer just like me. You know, the, I think the moment we both found out we're cancers, we became and so we clicked. Mm. Just being really, really good friends. Mm. And so for me, like at this point in my career, watching stuff like that happen, yep. being able to, you know, help mm-hmm. young players become, mm-hmm. you know, a homegrown name, homegrown talent. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it's 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 really gratifying. Way different though, hey, from, oh, yeah. when, you, from when you came into the league to the, where right. you are and your perspective and right. what you're oh, actually yeah. doing is like it changes because you you have to evolve as a player. Or you're, you're out. You're out. Like I've seen guys. Rule changes. Guys forced to retire because they can't yep. evolve as a player. Mm-hmm. You know, mentally they don't evolve. Physically they don't evolve. Right. I can tell you this. Every year I've gone <laughs> to the I've gone to the season a different weight. Because the league keeps on changing. You're things, adapting. The so game things, changes. I think again the, the game changes. Positional changes. Mm. You have to find ways to make it work. Yep. You know, like you got to find ways. Like you got you got to find ways to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Like you, you really got it. Like if you can find joy in that, mm-hmm. where like you're uncomfortable and the mm-hmm. process of getting comfortable mm-hmm. is what you're mm-hmm. dwelling in. Like, dude, that's way different. Coach Jones came up to me one year. I think it was eighteen or nineteen, and he's like, "Can you cover the best Canadian receiver on the other team?" And you I'm only like, have one answer, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Whatever you need, Coach. I go home. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? What I'm, am I like, figure boy, out? What? I'm like, he wants me to do what? Now, like, we're playing like certain teams, like their Canadian receivers play Z, some play R. So I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna have to know, you know, every single spot. I'm mm-hmm. gonna have to know the system pretty well. And as a safety, I'm gonna have to get guys lined up if we get in a mm-hmm. situation where guys can get lined up, you mm-hmm. know, because they're gonna look, you make the strength calls. If I'm here and this guy doesn't know where to go, I gotta, you know, try to help mediate mm-hmm. that. So I was like, okay, let's do it. I'm in. Take, take the challenge and, and you, take it one day at a time. That uncomfortable thing is, you know, and before we got before we got talking and I told you about Trey and, and yeah. the one thing that was like, I think you just answered it. That you being uncomfortable, like at that, yeah. that is a very different approach versus like, ah, you know, I take care of my body. I mean, if you're not comfortable, situa- even in a situation where you're not comfortable and you're fine with that, like, why would you want to be uncomfortable? Mm. And then you you get comfortable, and it's like you get you get you get lethargic, like complacent too, complacent. right? Complacent. You just like eh, nothing. Accidental. And then and whoever's whatever's coming up behind reality you, hits. It's like right. You get that, that process. You know, you learn more in the process. Whatever you learn in the process would propel you down in life. Mm. You know, like sitting down and passing, finishing school, like. N- Trusting myself, I can take five classes. Those dog days of you know, if you if you if you came to my house and see my office when I was studying for one of my science classes, computer science. Oh God! I had all this stuff on written down. And it's just like I didn't know I could study like that. But if I wasn't freaked out about failing and not graduating, and telling myself, hey, I need to find a way to get this done. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, when I have kids and they don't want to go to university, you know, so now I'm like, okay, figure it out, get comfortable. Mm-hmm. You don't like so I used to get have anxiety going to class. That's why I never went to class. Because you were I'd be in class, my palms would be sweaty. Because you were worried that you just you weren't gonna figure it out or you were just watching everyone else. Because when do we things. moved to Canada, I had that whole thing going on in school with how I answered questions, yeah. how mm. I was treated, right? So mm. the whole classroom setting for me became very scary. Mm. You know, when I came and I was bullied, mm-hmm. I was chastised because of the way I talked, you know, mm. stuff like that. Mm. You know, you're sitting there and you're like, all right, this there's some sharks in this mm-hmm. classroom. It right? doesn't go away. So it doesn't. It doesn't go away. And then you just end up. You just end up just like. <laughs> I don't want to go to class. I don't want to go to class. I don't want to go to class. But, that is, but that, it's these these moments in your life though also create like how you react in certain situations too, right? Yeah. Like it's just it's not a, it's not a coincidence that you've been able because you start realizing like okay I'm not a bad student. Yeah. I just need to find ways to apply myself. Yeah. To make it work for me. Yeah. Like I said, you got to get comfortable in comfortable situations. Dude, that, that, I don't know if you've ever said that out loud or how much. To my head, maybe. It's, it's way different. It's, it is it's because 
like you were you were in class and you seen people get A's and you seen kids like they're going out and partying, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why can't I do both and mm -hmm. still get A's? Because not everyone's the same. Yeah, we're all built different. Yeah, they learn in certain ways. It's yeah. they learn in certain ways, you know. And they went from like just showing up, okay, I'm gonna print my notes, and then they went from I'm gonna print my notes and bring a highlighter, and then it went from I'm gonna print my notes the night before, highlight the points. Mm -hmm. Before I go to class the next day, mm. so now I have a better understanding. You're working, so now I really don't have to go to class and take notes. I can go to class and listen. So I think really finding, mm. learning about yourself, understanding mm. who you are, yep, it's, it's important. Crazy, yeah, man. But every in every facet, though, right? Oh yeah, in ball and school, ball, school, like, in all your relationships, yeah. like oh yeah, she, <laughs> you, you better know who you want in your relationship, man. You better know who you are, <laughs> man. Listen. Relationships is work. Every day you get up, you got to clock in. You can't take no days off. Same mm -hmm. thing. Like, you know, got to invest yourself. Got to commit yourself. Yeah. Same thing with sports, school. Yeah. Like, what do you have a passion for? You know, I have a passion for making sure my wife's happy. You know, seeing her happy, I don't, I don't show it, but it makes my heart smile. Mm -hmm. You know, when she's, you know, when she comes home and I've cleaned the house, mm -hmm. the dogs are fed, they've been walked. It's just like the basic things, right? And I hand her a glass of wine, and she doesn't have to come. You know, she doesn't have to come home and. Mm -hmm. Work and stand and clean the kitchen. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have to come home and feed the dogs. She doesn't have to come home and you know mow the lawn. She can come home and just kick her feet up, and we can get to watching our shows and mm -hmm. you know enjoying uh, enjoying life. Yeah, and I think that's just part of you know understanding yourself. Yep, it's okay for you to clean. You yeah, know, man. Get in there and you know cook, Work. cook a little bit. Yeah, you know, put a little effort to your relationship <laughs> and totally. see where the chips lie. Mm -hmm. Right. Super cool, man. This is this has been a really cool chat, man. This has been a fun. This has been a fun conversation. Yeah, it's been really really cool. And I think that you know, that uncomfortable piece, I just like that really sticks with me. And that it's oh, yeah. oh, it's yeah. something really different. I mean, there's times I was in Montreal. So when I first moved to Montreal, funny story, the guy gave my apartment away. So I called him on the phone. I I went in town to go find an apartment. So a week before I drive to McGill to go to school, he gives my apartment away. So I'm living on my car, going to training camp, but everything I have out of my car, my mom cooks for me. All the, all the, I gave the food to my teammates. I was like, y'all, y'all eat that. Cause it's about to go bad. You know, it's fried chicken, fried rice. <laughs> oh, the good stuff. The good stuff. So I'm like, so I'm like, you know, after practice, I'm like, yo, let's eat, you know, whatever. So it doesn't go bad. You know, I'm living out of my car and then my friend Zimmer, you know, gives me a place to stay. And then you start realizing I gotta get comfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable right now. Mm -hmm. I'm, really, I'm highly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So even like shh, finances, Sometimes you look at your finances, you're like, okay, I don't like what's going on here. Like my student loan, I was very uncomfortable with giving out X amount of dollars every month mm -hmm. to an institution, right? So I called them one time and I'm like, I want to pay my student loan off. This lady danced around for so long. I must have talked to three different people and they all were trying to convince me not to pay my student loan. So now I'm really getting uncomfortable. I'm like, why do you guys want me to have this debt? For, that's gonna hang over my head for so long. Call my mom. She's like, "Don't do it. Save your money. Just keep paying it." You know, my parents don't. You know, I'm mm -hmm. like, after. Mm -hmm. Done. Done. It's interesting, man. It's and, and what's uh, what's cool for me to hear for the first time is just to like to see the progression, because because you you there's been a lot of change over a pretty short amount of time, which is. There has been, it's been rapid change. And just because when you have sisters like mine, mm -hmm. who are always- Dude, I can't imagine. They're always like trying to accomplish something, do something. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you can't you can't get stagnant. Because mm -hmm. they, they'll, they'll pass you. Even right now, and I'm like, when I'm done playing football, I got to find something else to do to kind of, you know, make my parents realize I'm still the favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because right now, I think my older sisters got me off the hand on that. That you know. is going to be a mountain to climb. Though, right. Man. But, you know, it's, it's that's the challenge. That my parents instilled in us competing with one another. Super cool. Yeah, we've always competed. Like even for my mom's love. Like right now, you call my mom, mm -hmm. whoever's picture is on the phone. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a win. That's a win for us. <laughs> so right now, it's my marriage picture of me and my wife. So even when my wife, because she knows how we compete for my mom's <laughs> display it's on the so phone. Good you can say that. So so even when she realized she made, she was on my mom's display. She was like, "Oh my god, I'm on your mom's display." I'm like, "Yeah, we made it. <laughs> we made it." <laughs> <laughs> but that's just you know that's just the life we've like just the environment it's a know. cool family yeah um there's only one question i ask on the show to end it so when i say calgary where does your head go 
Oof. Banff Mountains. Always? Like the minute you got to Calgary, was it the mountains kind of called your name? Like there was something that something about them? There's something when you drive. I know you feel it when you when you leave. Yeah. Like, especially you get outside of Calgary mm -hmm. and you start seeing those mountains creep up. Mm -hmm. It's like a it's like a mental release, like a mental health thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Even like driving. One of my favorite things to do is drive to BC. That drive from here to BC is so beautiful. Just seeing, you see the animals, like the yep. you know, mountain, you know, mountain sheep and stuff yep. like that. You see, we saw a bear. Thought it was a rock one time. It was a bear and you still, I was like, man, that thing's massive. You know, it's just the Chinooks, like you said, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a young city and it's nice. It's, it's clean. Yep. Calgary's really clean in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated how they don't pour salt and they use sand because they want to preserve the cars. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the neatest things that, you know, I was like, that's kind of, that's a wasteful thing. It's so interesting. You yeah. know, so, someone that grew up out East, like yeah, when yeah. you grew up out here, you're just like, hmm, doesn't occupy any brain space. Right. And then it's not as over, overpopulated as in Toronto. You yeah. know, I live in Brampton. I went to go see my parents last month and driving in to see them 11 o'clock at night, there's traffic. Mm -hmm. It's not right. Yeah, yeah <laughs> There shouldn't be as many people on the road at 11 p.m. at night. And totally. It's just the uh, Calgary's more calm, and obviously my wife's from here. Yep. So, you know, when I moved out here, her family became my family away mm -hmm. from my family, right? So, yep. Calgary's a new home. It's cool, man. Yeah. Uh, and it's, my, it's nice living in enemy, enemy territory too. <laughs> oh my, it's, it's nice wearing a rough ride of gear and walking around. Do you, do you like rock green stuff? All oh over yeah, the city? yeah, yeah. Even when I, well, after I'm done, I'm going to the gym. I'm going to be wearing a rough ride. Go like, green. Yeah, and there's a trainer in there. He's a big Stan's fan, Vic, and he always like he gives it to me. It's nice. It's got to be like fun, like yeah, you be comfortable in those right? situations. <laughs> <laughs> that you have to like. Right, right, yeah. right. I mean, it's, it's neat though, but I mean, Stan's fans are cool. But, the, well, the other thing too, the amount of rider fans in Calgary is Right, like, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. Rider fans travel well, so yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, yeah. yeah. I give up more player cars in Calgary to rider fans. No way. Lot, yeah. yeah, I know a bunch of Saskies here and they're just like diehard, so. Man, they travel so well. Mm -hmm. We playing in BC. I couldn't see what's going on in the field. And I was like, oh. I was like, oh my God, we turned the ball over. It's like, no, we got a first down. I was like, really? <laughs> but <No>. we're away. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, no, the Ryder right, Ville, Ryder right Nation, uh, it's, I'm glad, because when I was in Montreal and I played here, it was just like intimidating to play here. When you like, you come in town for, the, you go in town for the game and see all that green, mm -hmm. it's kind of it's kind of intimidating. Mm -hmm. But when you're part of it, it's an energy. It's invigorating. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'm going to have fun watching it this year. Like please, I'm yeah. gonna, uh, I'm gonna, you know, I don't, ha I don't know how many years God is gonna bless me with. All I know is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it all I got while You're I can. In. You know, I gotta. Yep. There's nothing else to hold back for, right? It's the only you know, option. Yeah, you only got a few more clicks. Mm -hmm. What you gonna do? Mm -hmm. Make the best of it, and you know, right off the sunset. Yep. Uh, thanks for taking the time, man. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Super cool. This one, uh, yeah, I. Uh, it's it, like I said. It's just to hear the story, like not knowing the full thing. It's been really cool. You know, yeah, yeah. I, it's been a long. It's been a long. Like since we moved out here, it's been a learning process. Just mm -hmm. life, life in general. Just yep. I start realizing the relationships you, the people you meet. Like I tell people now, I don't have. It's hard for me to make friends now. I'm not into making new friends. I'm into cultivating relationships I have because mm -hmm. those are people that have been with me since I moved to Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, since. Like some of my friends now, they've seen me when I was a snotty, you know, skinny kid in school, you know, mm -hmm. and now they see me grow, you know. And so those people are the ones I, you know, I want to invest my time into, you know, mm -hmm. and that's just where I am in life. It's a good spot to be, man. Not bad at all. Yep. Okay, well, uh, we'll talk soon, I'm sure. Most definitely. Thanks. Thank you.